All right, I'm going to bring this, uh, <laughs> bring this work session to order. So uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, yesterday we had a rules committee hearing on this same topic. Uh, we're going to be discussing uh, the ordinance um, 2017 and 155. It'll be up for. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, and uh, 155S. Uh, there should be copies in the back of the S version, I hope. Um, and I emailed uh, some of the social service organizations with that yesterday so that they could see it. Um, I think we'll start, uh, it'll be a little bit repetitive from what we did yesterday, but Mr. Gates, could you start with just describing the changes between the original and the S version? And then we're going to open it up to, uh, uh, we heard yesterday um, from the sponsors of the ordinance and a little bit from uh, the APD, I'd like to hear from the social service organizations uh, their view of the impact of this ordinance. But we'll start with you, Mr. Gates. Could you please describe the changes between the original and the S version? Sure. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, did I miss the moment? Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, thank you. Start with you, Mr. Gates. Dean Gates is in the council. Forrest Dunbar. Christopher Constant. New training. Felix Rivera. Pete Peterson. Susanna Brown. Okay, and when, uh, when people testify, I'm going to ask you to say your name and uh, spell it for the record. But we'll start with you, Mr. Gates. How much time will I have to testify to Well, I, I don't think we'll have, I'm not planning, we have a full hour, so I'm not planning on limiting it to three minutes, for example. This is not testimony in the traditional sense, like at a public hearing. We're just going to discuss this topic. Mr. Gates? Okay. Thanks, Mr. Chair. So I guess I'll just go through the S version and uh, describe What's different here from the original area, which was introduced a while ago? So, um, the first change is the title changing guards to monetary in the sentence was planned. You see that more later on the ordinance. Uh, let me know if I can speak up, please. So, second, we have little warehouse clause changes. One just reflects the same change I mentioned, another is to uh, just explain that uh, for the last warehouse clause. It's really self explanatory. I can't estimate what the impact would be these changes, basically. And the changes aren't for economic impact, they're for social impact, or the crime reduction. So, section one of the ordinance um, uh, makes a, uh, well, there's no change actually for the original. Uh, section two of the ordinance, the bottom of page two, it was a new section added to the AO because we're changing, uh, making some changes to A80-30. That's at the bottom of page three uh, to state that the notice that is sent to an owner or tenant when there's an excessive number of police responses. It says these things, and we're including that uh, a notice shall advise that the owner or tenant of the commercial property didn't respond to you. Uh, has until the court is being with APD pursuant to A20B, in which case the fee may be waived. So all the form, if you were trying to be with APD, the fee will, may be waived. And uh, Mr. Gunbar yesterday said you want to change the May to a well be waived so that the line is more with what they did 20 says. Uh, so that's Bruger. Next change, top of page four. Um, it relates to uh, what is appropriate corrective action. And it says appropriate corrective action is uh, reasonably expected to correct the cause of these responses, current language. And we're adding another uh, aspect to what can be appropriate corrective action in the bold and underlined sentence for commercial properties, which is anything that's not a dwelling unit, uh, substantially reduce the volume calls for assistance, emergencies, or potential emergencies. And this determination is made by uh, sergeants in the police department for higher ranking. Uh, the next change, uh, this should help by the same, instead of just correcting the cause, at least substantially reduce calls, have some impact on volume of calls coming in from commercial property. So the next change, uh, the middle of page four, uh, changes the uh, security guards to security monitoring and incident response plan. So as one, I guess, example of appropriate corrective action. So maybe uh, a nonprofit or hospital or store can handle the security change with their current staff and stuff and just change their system, how they respond to incidents or how they could be about how they should be reporting things, install security cameras, things like that. 
So uh, the last change for the S version, page five. Um, uh, this talks more about the uh, intermediate APD to where the uh, fees accumulated for excessive responses in that calendar year. Um, I think that's about all. These are some words to the A and the uh, I should, I guess, mention one of the discussion yesterday. There were some questions. If you look up the definitions section of this form in code, in, 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 the definitions are very helpful. It defines what is a police response. There's a whole bunch of exclusions as to what's not a police response is, so or not counted in terms of what is a uh, excessive police response. So I don't know if we hope go over those. I think uh, the assembly members the message will be looking forward to Thank you, Mr. Gates. Are there any questions for Mr. Gates before we move on? Ms. LaFrance. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, Mr. Gates, so this may be a question concerning definition, but like for example, under the 8.80.020P for excessive police response, um, the last part, the owner or tenant of the commercial property or unit responded. Um, commercial property, does that include um, a property leased by a nonprofit as well? Or, or who, who is the commercial? Oh, Can I put a more fine point on that? So some of the properties we're talking about are actually public lands and infrastructure zone, PLI. And so they are not commercial properties. And I have a similar question. What are we talking about when we say commercial property? Because if I were to read that legally, that would probably exclude the Inter Brother Francis or anyone operating on municipal owned lands that are zoned PLI. Um, let me see. I, I, I can address that. I'm not sure if I um, commercial property is defined as an individual parcel tract or lot shown with some bad record that's not a residential property. So we have a, res a definition of residential property. And uh, it's an individual parcel tract or lot uh, containing one or more dwelling units or a mobile home. So it's not a dwelling unit or a home, kind of house, or a mobile home. Then it's everything else, which would be a non-profit that leases from a building, normal, a unit, strip mall, plaza, it's just everything else, basically. So, you know, the common conception of a commercial property, you can kind of set that aside for purposes of any, it's anything that's not a dwelling unit. Thank you, Mr. Gates. I actually wanted to ask the municipal attorney to follow up to that. Is that is that the interpretation that the administration has as well, or I guess that you have as well? And I think that Mr. Constant brings up an interesting point. Does the fact that, that the two properties that are most at issue here are technically PLI and I believe owned by the municipality, does that change things? Uh, certainly, Mr. Chair. Um, I, I think what you're conflating is zoning designations under Title 21 with definitions provided specifically in 880. So what Mr. Gates references is that 880 actually contains its own definitions of commercial and residential, which basically define residential as, as he's list, listed the certain types of residences and commercial as everything else. And so it's it's difficult terminology because it it harkens to the language in Title 21 of zoning, like PLI is a zoning designation of public lands and institutions as imposed under Title 21. And so uh, well, if the terminology is confusing, the legal definition is clear, and in this instance, you reference the definition in the same title as opposed to those the land designations, the zoning designations provided in the 21. But just to ask a follow-up to that, maybe it's what you're getting at, Chris, I don't know, but, you know, it's explicitly, no, I'm sorry, the other Chris was head raising the okay. hand, um, Mr. Schutte. So, uh, you know, we explicitly exempt federal, state, and local government properties. We own the property, but we are leasing the property. Can, so does that cause any any uh, any complications with this? I think it may merit clarification and, and perhaps would be continued to rely on the experts because I think your intent is to sweep in properties that are owned by a federal, state, or local government entity um, but uh, leased by some other operator and used for a different purpose to sweep those into the commercial category. And Mr. Gates can correct me if I, I haven't spent as much time with this specific language as he has, so if there's some hook in there that he thinks gives us uh, makes it more clear, then I certainly defer to him. Um, but it, it could be an issue that merits more clarification. 
Mr. Parson. Part yeah. of what I was going to say, I might add some further clarity to that. It's it, as drafted currently. Um, one easy, easy way to look at it from the land use perspective is you have underlying zoning, which is what a seven member constant first uh, brought up, and then you have use. And really, the definitions that have been set up in 880 talk about use. So I think, as as the attorney uh, stated. Underlying zoning is not is not the issue. We're talking about the practical use of the property. Okay, Mr. Welton and Mr. Constant. Mm -hmm. The practical use of brother Francis. Well, that's a question. Do you consider that a residential property or a commercial property? That's certainly a definition question as well. Okay. Uh, Mr. Constant. Yeah, just I think your interpretation was slightly nuanced in a way that isn't accurate. And that is under B1, there's the person is federal, state, or local government agency, right? Not uh, not an operator on a piece of government land, right? There's a difference. So we aren't <coughs> operating that operation. So, but I do have one more question on the language before we move off the team. And this is uh, a question I'll probably discuss later. It's, um, seems like on the last page, page five under section C, we're missing something there. It's not just a reduction in cost, we're looking for change in practices. So uh, on line 12 of that page five, I would think that we really mean there was a substantial change in practices or reduction in volume of cost. Um, if that's the question, you know, I think that it really <coughs> allows case by case approach by either the sergeant or higher ranking officer to determine whether there's been, I guess, um, sufficient action taken to address the issues. So it's, this isn't really specific as to exactly which version. I, I would say it does, though, because what it states here is there was a substantial reduction in volume of call. And there's a big difference in judgment of a, a sergeant saying, well, they really are doing things better here than a black and white benchmark of a number. You also don't have to find some signature. If you felt there should be, I guess, some other language saying maybe there's no reduction in calls, but there's some good faith option of tenants or the owner, um, to address the issues. But despite, in spite of those efforts, not good faith action, the calls aren't decreasing, that they should still have the fees waived. So perhaps uh, you would want to suggest some amendments on Tuesday evening uh, to add some phrase in there to accommodate that uh, concern that calls aren't reduced at all or increased, but it's not the owner or tenant's fault. Maybe external factors contribute and stuff like that. So, uh, and then I wanted to mention as well, um, when we talked about, yeah, the Miss Paligone's land, and you lease it out, well, that's a, a leasehold, that's a tenant, and tenants can be liable for you know, the excessive uh, fees for excessive risk response. So it doesn't always track back to the owner of the property. That, that addresses as well, like apartment building owners, uh, you know, maybe they are responsible for the cause of one apartment unit someone having parties all the time and so forth. So, thank you. So, uh, thank you, Mr. Constant. Um, we're going to go to Pete for one question that I want to bring forward the social service providers uh, that attended today. Mr. Peterson. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and here, I'm looking at the changes on page five under C, and we're talking about a sergeant with a, with a higher rank gets to determine whether it's a substantial reduction or not. That seems somewhat subjective to me because different sergeants could have different views of whether you know they were successful or not. And I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't have the suggestion to make that better, but I just thought I'd make that point. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Uh, so let's start with uh, actually is the hospital association here because I know they attended yesterday and didn't get a chance to speak. Would you please? Um, you can uh, take a seat here and uh, identify yourself for the record. Um, good afternoon, my name is Connie Beamer and I work for the Alaska State Hospital and Nursing Association. Um, I'm the director there and just 
really appreciate the opportunity to correct by uh, some comments. And then I also want to thank each and every one of you for the amount of time and effort you've spent on the ordinance and your work and everything like that. Um, we represent more than 65 hospitals and nursing facilities and other health care organizations around the state. We've been around um, for about 60 years. Um, we understand firsthand the issues that this ordinance is attempting to get at. Um, hospitals treat uh, vulnerable populations, including the homeless, and we often deal with similar problems as those that are motivating this ordinance. Um, we work with other organizations on ways to address these issues in our communities. Um, however, we are very concerned about the unintended consequences of the ordinance. Um, for instance, if um, the nonprofits that are serving uh, these populations are, are unable to do so, um, that could drive um, an increase in um, patients in our emergency departments. Um, our emergency departments are already overwhelmed right now. Um, there are various factors for that. Um, we have a statewide and a national opioid epidemic. We're also facing um, reduced beds at the Alaska Psychiatric Institute, and that's a real problem for us. Um, another uh, cascading issue is the rise of violence in our facilities. Um, before this ordinance was introduced, we were already working with the Anchorage Police Department to address the violence, the escalating, the just overwhelming escalating violence we were seeing in hospitals um, in our state. Um, so we were working in this partnership and we're just uh, concerned that this ordinance may um, be a step backwards in that, in that partnership with law enforcement. We see them as community partners and we want to continue that good working relationship we have. Um, all of our hospitals in Anchorage have really robust security departments, um, and they've invested a significant amount of funds, one um, upwards of a million dollars to address the um, rising epidemic of uh, violence against healthcare workers. So as part of our work in the state, um, we introduced, we um, helped introduce a piece of legislation, um, House Bill 312, to address violence against our caregivers. Um, it uh, quickly passed the House and also through the committees in the Senate and it's uh, sitting in Senate rules. We're very hopeful that it will pass this session. And we really do believe that it sends the right message to our um, health care workers that they are valued and supported. Um, we believe this ordinance um, may send a contrary message that if you call for help that um, you could be penalized and, and we have concerns about that. Um, also, acts of violence are already um, very underreported, and we're really trying to encourage our those who are um, uh, victims of assault to report, and we want to have um, open communication lines with uh, the police department to address um, issues in our community together. Um, we also, um, just the nature of what we do and the services we provide to the community, sometimes the um, APD will drop off patients for medical clearance at our facilities, and some is in as those patients become violent, we have to call them again to come pick up the people that they brought to us. Um, again, I want to touch in on, on the message that this sends and, and why it's really important. For instance, hospital leaders right now are working to correct the um, this message to their employees that um, violence in a healthcare faci facility is acceptable and that they should tolerate that. And that is um, a long-standing message um, that we are trying to overcome. It's something in our society. Um, and it isn't easily changed. And so this just doesn't seem like the right time to be sending um, a different message that says um, don't call for help when we need it. So we really need to be careful about messages that we convey um, because we don't want to send the wrong message to the, to the caregivers who are treating people in our community. Um, we do support accountability that was mentioned yesterday. We are concerned about creating an environment where healthcare workers who care for the people in their most fragile states and at times of needs will not feel that they can call for help when they need it. Thank you for allowing us to comment today, and um, we just really appreciate being able to engage on this important community topic. Uh, Mr. Constant, Mr. Peterson, just you, and then Mr. Weddle. I'm going to start with Thank you, the Mr. toughest question, then I'll come back after other people, so I'll dominate the conversation. But when you say you support accountability, what does that mean? We support, um, I would say, being a part of the, the solution. We understand it. We um, contribute quite a bit to these efforts um, as a whole, and so um, we, we support it. We're on the table. What is it? Um, we support all vulnerable patients in our community. We do that every day. The question is accountability, though. If not this, what other measures are there that you as a group could support in helping to other than the Phil and Juno, which I agree with, 
create some sense of accountability. Well, I think we're at the table. I think there's numerous things going on right now. And whatever we can do to be part of the solution, we will, we will do it. I'm sorry for being so vague. But yeah, it's hard, right? I've worked, it is very hard. That's a very difficult question, but we have a lot of good employees. I mean, if you look at the healthcare workforce we have in the state, it is top notch. And they are really, they are the most caring and compassionate people we have. And I can tell you that they're. They're willing to step up Just one last comment. I, when I think of accountability, I don't think of accountability for the hospital workers and nurses. What I think about for accountability is the violent people that are being circulated from the hospital to the shelter, then to my neighbor's house, and then back to the hospital, and then back to the shelter, and then back to my neighbor's house. That's who I think the accountability question is about. We're, we are clearly hearing the message, we need social service support. And that's coming from all the way up the eighth floor. When we talk about accountability, I don't hear a lot. So. Right, well I think that House Bill 312 um, gets at that and we were a leader in that effort, so. Mr. Peters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you mentioned early on uh, that uh, there are fewer beds available at API. That's and, correct. And is that for budget reasons or? There's um, a remodel that is going on that I believe, um, don't quote me on this because I'm not um, directly involved in the, the issue at hand, but I believe it um, recently came up with that. The renovations of that were actually going to be extended. They're, they're not meeting their deadlines, so it's a, uh, causing a crisis for our hospital members. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Peterson. Mr. Weddle. I got a question, but before the question, I think some things that they do for accountability is you guys are funding or participating in having health care people at Brother Francis. So that would reduce calls there and also reduce your lower emergency in August. So that would yeah. decrease calls in both locations. I mean, that kind of thing is very right. much in line with what we're looking for here. But as far as it's applying to you, there's a condition here that you um, are A-OK -okay if you provide on-site security monitoring and incident response planning, yes. which you do in abundance. Yes, we so do. You're really we're not, the you're free to clear. Right, but we're concerned about the shelters um, and the burden that this would place on them that could eventually drive to our emergency department. So we are in opposition to that. What would be that way? So if they were if they were uh, subject to fines that they could not afford and then they go out of business um, and they're no longer providing those safety net services, we become the next safety net. And those patients could potentially arrive in our emergency department and then that cost the community just in the cost of emergency department care would um, rise the cost of, of health care. Yes, Mr. Wellington. So, so an example would be if um, Brother Francis or other similar operations said, okay, well, we got too many calls, our problem is we are simply overloaded with this problem, so we are not going to allow more than 75 residents in our building at any time. So now the other 75 people need a place to go, and you think they may come to you or they could, yeah, they do. burden you. They do. When people are hungry, um, when, they, when they are in emergency situations, they do come to our emergency departments, and we are required by federal law to treat, to assess them, and to treat them, and to um, make sure that they're stable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Wellington. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Beamer. Is that right? You. Um, and your first name is Connie, C-O-N-N-I-E. Thank you, uh, just for the record. Okay, great. Well, we're going to go to the next one, but please hang around because there might be follow-up questions. Uh, is there someone from either Brother Francis or Beans Cafe who would like to speak at this time? You both will get a chance, but you can choose who comes first. Please uh, state your name and spell for the record. Sure. Lisa Souter, L-I-S-A, S-A-U-T-E-R. I'm the executive director for Beans Cafe and the Children's Lunch Box. Um, we did print off, I previously brought something similar to this to the assembly before. Um, just to make you aware that you know we have really good... Um, we, as a campus, have really been working very closely together uh, with the hospitals, with the uh, staff that is manning the clinic, and I'm sure Lisa will talk more about that, um, to reduce, reduce those types of calls. Um, we also have been working with the CAP team, with the mayor's office, with Nancy Burke, um, really doing everything we can. But bottom line, you know, these cafe facilities is built to capacity of 251 people. We are currently seeing over 500 people a day. 
it's not sustainable for us, for the community. We need more resources. Um, you know, my peer before spoke about the lack of mental health facilities available. Um, I'm sure Mr. Constant can speak to the lack of resources for addiction treatment available in our community. These two things compounded with the opioid epidemic, spice, highest unemployment in the nation, and many other contributing factors, including, frankly, the closure of camps and the direction of APD for people to go to Brother Francis and Beans have inundated our campus with people who need help desperately. And there are not the resources available in our community today to meet the demands of those people. And we're trying to do everything we can to keep our doors open and serve people, refer them when there's a place to send them, <coughs> and get them the help they need. But I can tell you honestly that if this ordinance were to pass, there would be a very good possibility that our board of directors would look seriously at uh, risk analysis of our entire business model. Because frankly, it's a business. If we can't pay our bills and can't pay our employees, we will not be in the business of helping people anymore. And it could very likely come down to what my counterpart from the hospital association fears, which would be limiting the number of people we could serve, the number of hours we could be open, and the services we could provide. Because we can't do it with no money. And the facts are that 90% of our money is donated to us. It is not from the municipality, it is not from the state, it is not from the federal government. And frankly, the press that has happened around campus with this inundation of people seeking services and needing help has tarnished the reputation of Beans Cafe, Catholic Shelter Services, and Brother Francis Shelter to probably an irreparable level. We have had longtime donors who say, I will no longer support you because you're not doing the right thing, even though we are doing the same thing we have done since 1979. Our mission has not changed. So there's been great damage done to the agencies as well because of the situation in our community. And again, this is not something that is unique to Anchorage. This is happening all over the United States. So I think we need to look at this as a community issue. Um, we can't be responsible for somebody off of our property and on the sidewalk. However, we do. Our team goes and does welfare checks on people on our left. They do welfare checks on people up Third Avenue, down the road. Whenever someone is in need of help, our staff goes and responds, on property or off property. Currently, is that a sustainable model? Probably not under this ordinance. It would not be. And that would greatly endanger people's lives. We have stepped up. You know, you talk about accountability, and I certainly understand that, Chris. Um, we have almost doubled our frontline staff, which we call monitors. Our current cost for our monitors, this is salary only with salary and benefits, is almost $400,000 a year. That $400,000, if we weren't having to put in place, for lack of a better word, security and monitoring of the outside parking lot, of frankly the neighborhood, and of inside our building, we could be feeding a whole lot more kids through our children's lunchbox program. I could take on 10 more schools of weekend food with that amount of money. And that's a shame. Because we have hungry people, we're trying to get them the services, but we're having to redirect our money to keep our business safe and to keep our staff, volunteers, and clients safe. And that's a lot of burden for a small, homegrown, grassroots nonprofit to bear. Thank you, Ms. Souter. So we have a couple questions. Uh, we'll start with Ms. LaFrance. Oh, uh, Oh, I thought you were ahead of him. <laughs> uh, right, well. One is your total in 2000. Are these numbers of calls that they for you? This is Not just these. This is calls that were generated by our staff. Right. I can't, I don't know who was called from the community, who's called from bystander, BFS, Phoenix Security, Securitas. This is during our hours of operation that our staff has made these calls. And recently we've been on track with Molina, Freeland from the Muni, who has been, um, I sent her our call log every single day of the previous day, how many calls we made for ASP, how many EMT, any ASP, <coughs> and she has been saying, yes, your call log and our numbers are exactly jiving. So, I mean, the operations have been dinged by being part of a bad grid, but it looks to me like you had 49 calls for APD last year, so you would not be violating the day or something like that. Possibly, but it's the whole concept of it, and how would you know to only charge me for these calls? How, who's going to determine what call gets charged to who? Well, you seem to know. Well, I know, but would you, you know, I'm trying to, yeah, it's, it, 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 it does know. If you give it all to APD, APD decides who the calls are. Mm -hmm. um, they're not, it's, it's, not, it's not what we charge, and sometimes those numbers are judged, but they haven't always judged in the past, and it's good we're working together now, but who knows who the who decides this? 
Well, you're not even close to it. You're just half of the hundred. But as a campus and as an area, we have to, again, how would they assign those calls to who would, who would be fined for those? And you can imagine the, you know, the, the time that it also takes for us to spend every day logging these, tracking these, sending these to the community. Again, we could be using that time and resources to help people find housing, move them along, work with them in the workforce readiness program, and instead we're doing this. So, yes. you also said you're spending you know, $400,000 a year on monitors. But to meet your mission, you need these. Is we did not need it. We needed two in the past. We used to have two per shift. We now have five due to the increasing escalation of violence and inappropriate activities that we see on our campus. And the area. But people are what they are. People are really so to do what you do, you need to have monitors. It's um, fundamental. It's just like you have plates and bowls and plates and food. You have to have monitors. But it's also because the camps have been closed and people have been driven to social services, which I completely understand and support that we can't help somebody and move them out of homelessness if they're not engaged in social services. But we did not stand up any additional resources when that was done. And as I said, you know, our facility built for 251 people is now serving 500 people a day. Close the door. That's our max. Well, they're in and out all day long, so we may not have 500 people in there at once, but I don't think the goal was ever, that we ever imagined, probably when that facility was built in the 80s, that we would be seeing, you know, 1,200, or, you know, if you look at the current count, 1,200 homeless people is probably a lot more than that, that we would need to serve in our community. Okay. This is with France. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, thank you both for being here. Yesterday, in the discussion, it was mentioned revised ordinance, the S version, was characterized as providing nonprofits with another tool or method to address um, the issue of excessive police calls. I mean, do you see anything in here that um, empowers you or gives you more resources or any tools for doing this? No, 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 absolutely not. We already have on campus, we're setting up um, a committee that is going to be one representative um, from the community, kind of a campus liaison type person that I believe is going to be housed under rural cap, uh, a manager from Brother Francis Shelter and a manager from Dean. So we're going to take those people with the highest needs that we have recurring issues with, and we already do this anyhow, and they will have to come before the committee and be referred out to hopefully resources that will continue to grow in the community because right now they are sort of lacking. Um, but you know, I know right now I believe there are six people that ASP will not serve. It doesn't matter how intoxicated those people are, they will not take them into custody because they're too violent. Well, those are the same people I'm serving lunch. And uh, these are the same people that are going to the ER because they can't be served anywhere. We have to find some resources for the people that are the hardest to serve. And those are the ones that I think there's really probably a small percentage of people that really are causing great havoc in our community in all areas, in the hospitals, in the shelter, at the soup kitchen, um, at mental health services, everywhere. And that's not the job of a soup kitchen and day shelter to deal with. So uh, I'd like to ask a question, and we'll go to Mr. Content and Mr. Wilkins. Well, there is a place for those people called jail. I mean, at some point, well, they don't want, we, we can't arrest our way out of the yeah. problem, but for six people, we'll put them in jail for a long time. Yeah. 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 So I think the other thing to be smart out is that that's that, that, that's the only way. That's six calls. Yeah. Again, that's a law enforcement issue, not something we can do. Right. So uh, yesterday, and you know, I was going to hold this question until after Ms. Aquino had spoke as well, because I think it's kind of the overlying que or underlying question. But I think we need to direct the conversation a little bit. So, you know. We've seen actually in the last couple of months, and it's a little bit hard to see in the data you provided here, but the impression at least is that the calls have been significantly reduced, that this is actually a success story, that the municipality and, and your agencies working together have done a better job of improving security and reducing calls from that campus. Yesterday, Ms. Nabosky stated that, that was be you were cooperating with the municipality because Mr. Traney and her had introduced this ordinance in November and that had motivated you to be more cooperative with the municipality. Um, so could you please address Ms. Tavasi's point? And she said that she had spoken with people in the municipality and that's what they had said. Well, that can I, because I have a little bit more history. Can I go first on what point? Just the only thing I want to say is, I wish you would have been going to me in Magic Crab meeting yesterday and address Ms. Tavasi directly. Yeah, um, 
you know, I've been in this position for almost five years. And one of the first things that I did when I took the position was meet with Lisa's predecessor, uh, Susan Bomaleski. And Dr. Bomaleski and I, at the time, realized that there were significant issues on campus that both agencies were dealing with. And at that time, we appealed to Mary Sullivan and to Chief Mew to provide additional resources because of the escalating behaviors and violence we were seeing and the drug issues and everything else. We were turned down flat. No, there's no resources. There's no additional help available. This has been a repeated ask. We have been asking, frankly, for this partnership with APD and AFD for at least the five years I've been here, and I think it way predates me as well. So oh, I would say no, say it's not the ordinance. Catholic Social Services has been asking for and has partnered with APD and AFD um, and uh, with the Safety Center for decades. And we're really proud of the partnership, and they've been terrific partners. And we've been, but we have been asking for a bigger police pres presence again for decades, for two decades. So um, that's something that we've been wanting. And so we were so grateful when the mobile intervention team was made available, and that partnership we we could build on because not that wasn't just um, the partnership that we had already had, where it was meeting and coordinating. It was like we had real time of theirs that they're putting towards our campus. And so I think, and and the and the surrounding area, and 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 so uh, I we, we we really appreciated that, and that's a huge difference, and something that hasn't been. And but we but we've always partnered with the muni and all the age and and all the law enforcement and emergency service uh, agencies, and we and we have, you know, we have a lot of demonstrations of that over a long time before probably a lot of us. Were so I'm going to ask a brief follow-up, and then we're going to Mr. Constant, I believe. And at one, point, at one point, my understanding is there was a substation at Beans Cafe many years ago. So if we, if we take the, so the kind of $64,000 question, right, is if we take uh, as a predicate the notion that the last six months have shown pretty remarkable improvement in cooperation between the municipality and the social service agencies, and that's the same time that this ordinance has been sort of out there in, on the table, um, do you think that that cooperation will fall apart uh, if this ordinance is either voted down or otherwise taken off the table? So, I just want to say that I feel like um, uh, that uh, social service agencies have wanted to and have for, again, decades, by the fence has been here since 1983, partner with the municipality. And we've asked in every kind of way that we could. And some administrations are really in favor of that, and some administrations haven't been. But we've stood here the entire time anyway. We we didn't feel like, it's really been very, very recently that we felt this animosity with the municipality and, and people here pointing the fingers at us as if we're against them. We've been doing this same work for the longest, longest time. If there's ways we can do it better, terrific. We want to do it. We want to always want to partner. We've always wanted to partner. No, no threats from any ordinance made that different. If anything, it just made us feel like, made us not trust the intentions that you all have because you seem like you're going after us. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's not fair because we're the people providing the service to people in this town that you represent. So, all right, uh, Mr. Constant, then Mr. Weldon, do you have another? Uh, well, Mr. Con I, I well, Mr. Weldon, can we go to Mr. Constant first? He's been waiting. Oh, that's fine. Okay. So, um, I can tell you 10 years ago, sitting in the Fairview Community Council room, that the messaging coming from the Brother Francis shelter was everything was okay. And it didn't matter how the neighbors jumped and shouted and said, this is not okay. The message coming out was, "This we're working, we're doing good. And the, so that was the public face. And um, of course, those of us who live near and around these facilities know that's not the case. And it took a lot of fought, hard fought work to get Susan Bomolaski to admit we have a problem, right? A 12 step model, the first thing is to say we have a problem. And the next step is to figure out what the hell you're gonna do about it, right? And so, and I understand the need for that is because you guys have to raise money from the public. And the public has to believe in you in order to give you their treasure, because they're not gonna throw money at a problem that they don't think is gonna be resolved. 
But there's dissonance there, cognitive dissonance in the community. So, I think you hit on the problem at the very beginning of your testimony. And it's not that your mission has changed or hasn't. It's not that the will of the community to see you successful has changed. What's happened is that you are serving 500 people in a facility designed to serve 250, and every answer to the problem is drive more services there. At some point, wouldn't you agree we reach a functional capacity for those services, those buildings, the structures, and the environment to support these issues, these people? I, I think that there is not enough capacity for anything right now. There's not enough capacity for emergency shelter. There's not enough capacity for drug and alcohol treatment. There's not enough capacity for mental health treatment. Does it all need to be concentrated in one area? Frankly, that's for the assembly and the community to decide. Um, but we need more resources. Where they're located, I think, is, is a community and assembly issue. Right, but your building was designed, right, for 250 people and Absolutely. you're serving 500 Absolutely. and that is creating a highly difficult environment to manage. Because there's no other resource for those people. Right, and, and assuming there were other places to go and you could cap the number at, say, 250 or the shelter at, we can serve 250. We, we, our we number is 240. Right, <laughs> I, I, but, that's it. but all around is everyone else. Because there's nowhere else for people There's to nowhere go. else for them to go. That is the answer to the problem right there. Is right there. So, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Mr. Weddleton. Well, based only on this picture we have right here, you had said that after this thing got stirred up that they were working better and having less calls. But in fact, for the first four months of this year, they had substantially more calls than they did in the first four months of last year. So the calls for police, that's what the building accounts for them. But that's just means cafe, and it's not the yeah, whole. This is just means cafe. It's not the whole area. And I, I, it's been represented to me at least by the administration that things seem to have calmed down in the area a little bit in the last okay. several months. And uh, it might be of interest, and I might, if you're interested, look back at how many calls there were in the time before there was a crackdown on the and see if there, if, see if there has been changes. Because I, I think that those, the calls in that area are a symptom of, of a lot. questions for these two providers. Uh, do you have any comments on the S version uh, versus the original version? Ms. Aquino, perhaps Ms. Sauter already gave her testimony. Yeah. Well, so I, I, would, I would agree with Lisa that if it had, if, if there was a fines issue, and that's a, because, because the population we show, and, and our call numbers are not retired, or not, they're close to these numbers as well. And but we've always tried to work on them because there are too many, well, you know, one's too many. But if there was a fine association associated, we would have to make some, we would have to budget in that we would have to make calls, potentially, or the, or if calls would be coming from that area that we're not, we don't have control of. And we would, and then the cuts, we would potentially, as a, an agency, have to make some cuts, and that, that would be to staffing, and then we would have to make decisions about how we can 
if we can take the number of people we do or things like that. If the S version, I guess my feeling about the S version is that it seems to be predicated on on a threat and something that and and with the idea that we aren't that we don't already work closely with frankly anyone who will come and work with us because we will work with anybody that wants to come work with us we need all kinds of help so I, I don't the tone of it feels a little bit threatening and I think that you know Pat, Brother Francis Shelter began I was glad that the land piece came up because it began as a partnership between the city and the community through the, the Archbishop Hurley. And what the city brought to it was an abandoned building, a piece of land, and our utilities. And then until the until the 90s, the city paid the utilities for the Friends of Shelter because the city has a responsibility to the people that, that live here. And then they stopped paying the utilities, but we still have the land. And, um, and that partnership, when it began, it was unique, one of the unique ones in the, in the nation. And it feels like we've lost that a little bit. And I, I would really like to get it back, if we can. Thank you, Mr. Kino. Uh, Mr. Gates and then Mr. Weddleton. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I was just listening uh, to Ms. Salver, and um, she mentioned when they started cleaning up the illegal campsites, and look at that time frame. So in code, we adopted, we simply adopted our first comprehensive illegal campsite abatement process uh, in July 7, 2009. And I uh, guess there was some process where we have had some changes since litigation, the CLU, and so forth. We ended up with our final version roughly in 2011. Um, I'll, whether there's a correlation between the number of calls here and the cleanup of campsites and then having the process, that's fine. It's, I guess, we should take a closer look at whether there is a correlation or not. But I just wanted to mention the time and the interest that you gave me and what our code reflects. Although I don't think that that was actively enforced until sometime later. No, I was going to say, I think 20. <laughs> it may have been an ordinance, but it wasn't actively enforced. Oh, we did have a. We did have a uh, preliminary injunction where we couldn't enforce that code section. Yeah. Uh, I think for the whole summer of 2010. Right. Um, but I need to go back and check the time. And, I mean, we invested a primary, 2016, I remember, my first summer on the body, we, we made a substantial investment in park cleanup. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if before, the year before, the, the, minister, the assembly had done the same thing, but it was my perception that that was sort of a, a first time where we really pushed into the parks. It was the summer of 2016. Um, and I remember, at that time, we had testimony from the social service agencies saying we're full in a way that we are usually in the winter because people are not able to stay in their camps. Mr. Weddleton and Mr. Constant. I want to follow up, I guess for Dean, um, we're just looking at calls for police. And, and like Dean said, there's the implication that you're responsible for the entire grid. But, but this ordinance, either version, just talks about the enterprise, so it would be being separate from Brother Francis, only their calls, and not calls from the grid. Is that right? Uh, that's correct. That's my understanding as well. I don't so, know if that, that's um, the case. Sure. I, I have understood that some points in the past, and I don't want to speak for APD, but uh, sometimes there's a call for service that refers to the intersection, the street intersection. It's not a problem. So do they attach it to one of the adjacent parcels? I mean, I, I don't know, I suppose they do. So, um, we can get this cause for this whole grid that can't be six is all, you know, at Leeds or Red Francis or one of the other, or somewhere, maybe a couple blocks away uh, within the grid. So, you know, like Mr. Dunbar recognized, there's, there's spending for camp cleanup efforts when you're and there's these factors in the end of year, uh, there's a whole bunch of factors to look at rather than say there's a direct correlation between one thing and this increased cause. So, um, thank you, Mr. Gates. Mr. Uh, Mr. Constant and then Ms. Wood Pearson. Thank you. So, the purpose of framing the discussion around the grid and not necessarily around the specific address, although I had those numbers yesterday for the 
EMS information, which is germane in only some respects, but not to the specific ordinance because EMS calls are excluded from these calls, is because the this idea of 250 people or 240 people and then actually serving twice as many of that has a net effect on the whole area and it's a, a, a hugely um, destructive dynamic and there is at least one individual here who lives and owns property in that environment and any decision we make that's public policy related in this area literally impacts other people's lives and so that's the purpose of the grid being the framework that I brought forward to the conversation, but it is important to look specifically at the addresses, and I do believe that the ordinance is that tailored. It's not talking about one operator is responsible for a whole grid of calls. But can I say yeah, Mr. Pino. Um, but it's not, but the calls there are the ones that our agency made. Like, People driving by say, I see someone at Brother Francis shelter that needs help, please come down, or there's some. So it's, they say Brother Francis shelter, are those calls counted? The ones that are not, are, that are not made by us and that are out of our control? Like finance calls? Should this thing pass, the administration would have to come up with a reasonable methodology, but I think this and this one goes to the same Yeah, that was the, the clarification I, I wanted to, to offer, Mr. Sheriff. There, I, the way that the, the 880 is structured, excessive police response is defined by responses to the commercial unit. So it's not defined by the source of the call, right. but by where the response is directed. So, um, the calls from the service right, and went on the back. There are other calls that to direct the police to that unit. They get down. And I can't speak to how APD technically figures out which property they tag each call to, but that's the way the language of the code defines it. Yes, Ms. Sue, And we'll Sorry. also say that, you know, people come to Brother Francis or Beans to seek assistance with medical assistance. If somebody is leaning up the hill, they come and get our staff to come help. You know, we're kind of the local fire station right there, right? If they need help, they come to us, whether they're in our building, two blocks away, three blocks away, they come to us for help. Ms. Aquino. And let us come back. Um, just because it, uh, there's this conversation about accountability and I wasn't here yesterday, but I think that I've come to you in the past and described the many ways that Catholic Social Services has, in particular over the past three years, really stepped up her, our own agency um, in terms of funding and resources and partnerships to make that area safer and better for those most vulnerable people we serve and everyone around there. So I feel like we're, like in terms of credibility and accountability, that's what, <laughs> we are we're made of that. That's what we do. I mean, we, we've staffed up considerably. We added security at night because we saw those things happening. Before so someone called and said, we'll work with you more at APD, we said, if this is dangerous, we're gonna add security. Um, we stay open all day and all night so that more people can get a shower and they can get laundry so they can go to a job interviews and get a job and stop having this happen to them. So I feel like we've really stepped up and been accountable. And if there's other ways that we can show you, write something down to demonstrate accountability, I'll, I mean, I don't, you don't need to make a, you don't need to do this that formally. Just ask us, we're happy to. Mr. Gates. Oh, I uh, just speak to say the <coughs> one point that uh, the screen appears to me, so I just can go to the okay. Thank you. Uh, we're coming towards the end. We have five more minutes. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this topic or any other questions from my colleagues? So I'm going to offer just a random bit of info. Okay. Um, Mr. In, in this deliberation that's gone on, I have been called all manner of horrible names by members of the community. Um, they're embodying things that I do not believe and I'm not asking for. One person said to me that, you know, it used to be respectable that we had hobos in our community. And today I did some research. In the old days, there were some definitions there were hobos, tramps, and bugs. And hobos were people who traveled the country working and kind of just living their own life. And tramps were people who only worked when they had to, if they were forced to. And bums were the ones who trashed the place and didn't contribute. So back in 1889, the National Hobo Convention of St. Louis, Missouri came up with a code. And in this code, it said a few things. Decide your own life. Don't let another person run or rule you. 
When in town, always respect the local law and officials and try to be a gentleman at all times. Three, don't take advantage of someone who's in a vulnerable situation, locals or other hobos. Four, always try to find work, even if temporary, and always seek out jobs nobody wants. By doing so, you not only help the business along, but ensure employment should be returned to that town again. Five, when no employment is available, make your own work by using your added talents at crafts. Six, do not allow yourself to become a stupid drunk. Set a bad example for locals' treatments of other hobos. Chris, are you going to read no, I am going to read. I'm almost done. I have I'm a point. Twelve. There are thirteen. I have a, no. There are sixteen. <laughs> <laughs> but keep interrupting. When, jung when jungling in town, respect handouts. Do not wear them out. Another hobo will be coming along who will need them as badly, if not worse than you. Always respect nature. Do not leave garbage where you are jungling. If in a community jungle, always pitch in and help. Try and stay clean and boil up wherever possible. When traveling, ride your train respectfully. Take no personal chances. Cause no problems with the operating crew or host the railroad. Act like an extra crew member. Don't cause problems in a train yard. Another hobo will be coming along who will need passage through that yard. Do not allow other hobos to molest children. Expose all molesters to authorities. They are the worst garbage to infest any society. Help all runaway children and try to induce them to return home. Help your fellow hobos wherever and whenever needed. You may need their help someday. And if present at a hobo court and you have testimony, give it, whether for or against the accused. Your voice counts. In 1889, there was a code. And my neighbors in Fairview have been asking for some years for some inst installation of a process where people start being shared the idea that there's a code. If you're going to live in an environment, be part of that environment. At this point, it looks like our neighborhood is soaked in bums. People who really don't care. They're destroying the place. Or another category not listed. Really, really sick people who should be getting medical help somewhere. So I just wanted to read that because this issue has been and will continue to be talked about. But some responsibility of those individuals is essential to this question. Otherwise, we'll never resolve it. Thank you, Mr. Constant. Uh, Ms. Souter, Ms. Kino, do you have anything to add before we close this work session? I would just add that you know we really do uh, work very closely with our clients. We have over 120 volunteer jobs they do every day. We don't have a single maintenance person on staff at Beans. We run our kitchen preparing 940 meals a day with one chef, and everybody else in the kitchen is a volunteer, and most of them are client volunteers. Community volunteers come in to serve the meals many times. But the bulk of the work of preparing the meals, serving the meals, cleaning up from the meals, cleaning garbage around the campus and the neighborhood is done by our clients. Now, not all of them are capable of doing that or willing to do that, but we try and engage every one of them every morning when they walk in the door to do a tour. So we are trying to do that and implement that. And that's always been a part of the Cafe. All right. Yeah, go ahead. Thank you. Thanks for letting me give me time to talk today. I really appreciate it. And please, please feel free to or if you'd like to come down to Brother Friends Shelter or CSS at any time, I'm happy to answer any kind of questions that come up um, that you need from Great. Yes, Mr. Friends. I would like to thank all of you in the social service agencies who are working hard to address the needs of this segment of our population. Um, clearly, this has shown that we need to work more closely together on collaboration. And I think this notion of threat, I'm very uncomfortable with that. Um, I like the idea of a partnership with the police, community council, and the agencies, and I hope we actively work towards that. So thank you all for what you're doing. Thank you, Mrs. France. We're going to move on to the next work session now. This work session is closed.